And now on Radio 4, Lynn Truss celebrates 50 years of the zebra crossing in Look Both Ways. A new traffic law came into force this week. Its main feature is a new type of pedestrian crossing, distinguished by broad white stripes. They are the signal for pedestrian priority. Once a pedestrian has set foot on these crossings, traffic must give way. That is the law. Fifty years ago today, on October the 31st, 1951, something rather odd happened to British roads. Someone painted black and white stripes on them, and not in a spirit of anarchic fun. Although it's no longer here, the first zebra crossing appeared outside Boots the Chemist in Slough High Street, and from that day to this, British pedestrians have known exactly what to do. Cross here, traffic will probably stop, but have a good look both ways before you start, just to be on the safe side. But why were black and white stripes chosen? Who decided? Half a century ago, at the Road Research Laboratory here in Slough, Dr George Charlesworth and his colleagues were examining the problem of safer places to cross. One of the first jobs uh, we were asked to do was to see whether pedestrian crossings could be made more conspicuous by using some form of marking at the crossing place in the grounds of the laboratory at Langley Hall, where we were housed then, it had been in the war part of Bomber Command, and they had an underground shelter. And the roof of this thing stuck up above the ground about uh, two or three feet, and it was black topped. And so my sister and I got some pieces of paper about a foot long and painted different patterns on them black and white patterns, stripes along the road, stripes across the road, diamond shapes and all sorts of shapes. And then we put these on the top of this uh, black top surface and viewed them at a corresponding eye height if we'd been motorists, say about two or three inches in this case, above the level. And uh, it was immediately obvious that the uh, most conspicuous one was the one uh, with the stripes parallel to the road, which is now called Zebra Crossing. For the first two months, the stripes actually led to more accidents as people got used to using them. It's hard for us to imagine now being unfamiliar with zebra crossings, but an early information film shows how odd it must have felt at first. Women scuttle furtively sideways in front of hastily braking buses or hesitate endlessly on the curb. Right foot in, right foot out, left foot in, left foot out, as if performing a nervous hokey-cokey. This is the sort of Jay Walker the zebra crossings are intended for. The safety stripes are all part of a plan, which, according to the Ministry of Transport, is designed to inspire all road users with respect and confidence for the whole crossing system. I asked one of my colleagues in the Ministry if he knew where this name zebra came from, and he thinks that it was James Callaghan parliamentary secretary in transport at the time and uh, he was asked some time later I believe but he couldn't remember but I bet anything that he, he was the one that thought the name of excuse me excuse me do you know is that the zebra crossing that the Beatles used for their album cover ah oh, the famous album cover four blokes cross the road outside their place of work and for the next 30 years, tourists come from all over the world to worship at a set of black and white stripes painted on some tarmac. When the Beatles made Abbey Road in 1969, their original intention was to call the album Everest, with a picture taken in the Himalayas. But internal strife meant the trip was called off, so they lowered their sights from the sublime to the ridiculous and made a virtue of let's do the shoot right here on the zebra crossing. The resulting picture by Ian McMillan was Paul McCartney's brainwave. He sketched it out with pin men in advance. And somehow this image of the four men strolling nonchalantly in single file on a kind of metaphorical tightrope has intrigued people ever since. So what better place to meet Stuart McConey than at Abbey Road? I think it does show a really innate kind of artist's sense of humour. Because in the same way that, say, Warhol took a soup can and suddenly invested it with new meaning. Or René Magritte took a pipe and invested it with a new meaning. McCartney showed, I think, quite a sense of kind of artistic fun and wit in taking a zebra crossing and investing it with some new meaning. And the reason it has that new meaning is because these are the four, possibly the four richest, most powerful, most famous men in the world. Certainly the four richest, most powerful, most famous musicians in the world. The notion of them being on a zebra crossing at all is a bit silly. The notion of them walking along in single file on a zebra crossing with that 
resonance of school kids in a crocodile is funny. It's the exotic and the kind of jarringly mundane at the same time that makes it so memorable. Come together. My name is Glyn Owen, I've come from Shrewsbury. I'm visiting London with my wife. It's her 40th birthday today. Uh, her treat was the golden eye, and my treat is to come to Abbey Road Studios and see the famous zebra crossing that the Beatles used for their album cover. We're Dan and Vicky Bear from Ontario, Canada. This is my first trip to uh, London, England, and only thing I needed to see and cross was Abbey Road, and I just finished crossing the street without my shoes or socks on. I had to cross the same way that Paul crossed on the album cover of Abbey Road. But uh, now that I've done that and my wife took a picture of me, I think uh, I can die a happy man. <laughs> Zebra crossings are very mundane and quotidian and daily to us British people. You know, we see them and use them every day of our lives. But other countries don't. So in a sense, as well as it being the Beatles, and isn't it wonderful, it's also a little bit as if they'd had their picture taken by a guardsman or a red London bus or something like that. It, there's something fetishistic and British about it as well, and I'm sure that adds to the cutesiness of it. I say, Chappie, where do you think you're off to? Well, it's my crossing when I put my foot on it, and you're supposed to stop. Oh, <laughs> one of those, are you? Ah, but, ah, but, ah, but you're supposed to proceed with caution when approaching a crossing. Thank you. That's just what I was going to say. Ken Dodd in a public information film from 1963. Abbey Road is, of course, only one crossing among an estimated 11,000 in Britain. And if international Beatle maniacs want to risk their lives to get their souvenir picture taken on it, well, they are a special case. But for those of us crossing a zebra simply to get to the other side, how does the law stand if an accident happens? In the early days of the zebra crossing, the law said the pedestrian had precedence. Once your foot was on the crossing, traffic had to stop. It was, if you like, absolutely black and white. But then, in 1971, there came the zigzag lines painted on the approach to the crossing, and the law got more complicated. Peter Lydiot is a justice's clerk who gives legal advice to magistrates. If a pedestrian is approaching the crossing, or even on the crossing, the motorist must know that before they reach the zigzag lines, they must accord precedence to the pedestrian. If they go into the zigzag lines and the pedestrian is about to move on, then strictly they don't have to stop because they're within the zigzag lines. But clearly common sense says, and it might be careless driving, not to stop. So the grey area is usually, and where difficulties arise, is where the pedestrian is about to come on the crossing and the motorist is sort of just at the beginning of the zigzag lines, who's got the right of way? Well, I think the law would, be, would say that both the pedestrian and the motorist have got to use their common sense, because there's no one around to referee this. It is very dangerous to cross the road near a zebra crossing. The zigzags mark the danger zone. Unfortunately, some people still forget. So please use the crossing, not the zigzag zone. If there is an accident on the crossing or within the zigzag lines, then the assumption in law would be that the motorist was wrong. But the only way that a pedestrian would get compensation for their injuries if they decided to bring a civil case and seek compensation from a judge. So, if that's the law for us in Britain, what about using zebra crossings abroad? Michelle Roberts spent childhood holidays in France and now goes there to write. Here comes the sun. There are copious zebras in my little local town, but they're just like a decoration on the street. They're very pretty yellow and white stripes. The cars take no notice of them. So even though you're legally, you know, allowed to step onto them, you have to really look ahead of you, spot the oncoming lorry and glare. It's as though your eyes have to turn into headlights. You have to switch them on full strength and then steam out. And you embark on it with a mixture of uh, agro, insouciance, a sense of humour and is it going to be all right this time? It's all right. On the continent of Europe, the law in relation to motorists is very patchy. But in some countries, particularly in Germany and Scandinavia, they're very strong about it and very well marked out and very clear and very regimented. I remember once when I was in Italy, I, I was driving and there was this vaguely marked out zebra crossing. So I stopped and I got 
honking horns from behind me. And there was me, the foreigner, trying to be respectful of, of the laws of the country. And of course, I didn't know the custom was you don't stop. There's a great love of the English in northwest France because the English are always stopping for people on crossings. So in the local village, there's a zebra outside the baker. And all these old ladies watch the road for about an hour until there are no lorries in sight and then they begin to stumble across with their baguettes. If I'm suddenly tootling up in my little car and I stop for them, they can't believe that I'm stopping. So they retreat. I have to then do the eyeballing as a driver and lean out of the window and beckon and wave. And they look at me and think, oh, yes, it's the mad Englishwoman. It's okay. She's stopping for me. I can go. I should say that uh, a colleague and I were sent off to Rio de Janeiro for a couple of months and we had a zebra crossing put down in Rio that was probably the first one abroad <laughs> that would be 1953 Rio in South America well they never put that on the advertising do they come to Rio and cross the road with confidence Anyone fancying a bit of practice crossing the road, however, might take a trip to the Inner Hebrides, where on the Isle of Tyree they have no zebra crossings, so teacher Elaine Williams has devised a scheme to expose island children to the alien street conventions they will encounter when they travel on the mainland. The Isle of Tyree is a very flat island, it's very, very green, uh, 17 miles long by about 3 miles wide at its narrowest point, um, mostly single track roads on the island with passing places and there's only two-way traffic at one point on the island and there's, there's no roundabouts, no zebra crossings. Um, we've got this big grassy area which we've been given um, to use as a play area and I thought it'd be a great idea if we could actually dig up some of the grass, lay down some tarmac, paint all the road signs on, including our zebra crossing and we're also going to create a, an area in the middle which is a, a snack area with a picnic table. So we're going to paint our zebra crossing across the road so the children can move from one side of the play area to the other. And the children could trundle around the roadway in their bikes and they'll have to look both ways, obviously, to see if the traffic's coming. Then they'll remember when they go to the mainland all about our zebra crossing that we've got in our playground and they'll be able to use it correctly and safely on holiday. Fifty years on from the birth of the zebra, it's unlikely the anniversary will be marked in any special way outside Boots the Chemist on Slough's High Street. But even in the first year of the zebra, despite the alarming start when people hokey-cokeyed on the curb, the number of pedestrian casualties was reduced by 7%. The black and white stripes have changed and saved our lives. And to celebrate that fact, we asked the poet Roger McGough, where would we be without zebra crossings? Where would we be without zebra crossings? Nipping in and out of the traffic jam, jogging on the pavement, waiting for takeoff, ready to sprint as soon as we can. Cross, cross, I'm getting cross, 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 I'm really cross, 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 I'm gonna cross now. Where would we be without zebra crossings? Lost in space without the black and white path, racing, pacing, twitching and itching to reach the other side in the face of death. Cross, cross, I walk across, cross, cross, make drivers cross, 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 almost across, suddenly it's motocross. Where would we be without zebra crossings? Ask the mother with the kids in tow. Like a white flag on the battlefield, waggle the pusher and off they go. Cross, cross, she's getting cross. Cross, cross, she's really cross. Cross, cross, she's gonna cross. Now! Where would we be without zebra crossings? Three big cheers for my old gran. Stick in hand, she works her magic, casting spells on white van man. Cross, cross, totters across. Cross, Cross, gives not a toss. Cross, cross, catches her bus. Bye, Gran. Roger McGough concluding look both ways with especially...